All right, hello everyone. Andrew Wangenbach here at St. Charles. We are in the Adoration Chapel, but as you can tell, that uh, the Adoration of the Blessed Sacrament has been moved into the church, and so we're still open, still Christ is ready to come and see you. And I have a very special guest today, Deacon Nigerian. And one of the questions that I've been wondering for a long time, Deacon, is what is the heritage of your last name? I, I was thinking it might be Polish because it's got lots of consonants, but there's no ski at the end. So just wondering if you could let us know what the heritage of your last name is as we start. Yeah, my father and grandparents were Armenian. Armenian. So Armenia was a little country between uh, the Black and the Caspian Seas in Asia Minor. Okay. And Armenia has the distinction of being the first country converted to Christianity wow. in 301 AD by St. Gregory the Illuminator. He was known as the Illuminator because his side job was working for the Armenian Power and Light Company. There you go. All right. Actually not. Oh. <laughs> he <laughs> illuminated the faith. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. You had me. You got me there. Okay. Have you had any really cool nicknames? I mean, Nigerian seems like one of those that would be quite, quite nicknameable. Uh, you would have come up with many had you been around in my childhood. Yeah, I wrote some down. Do you want to hear me? <clears throat> oh, I guess we might not have time for that. No. <laughs> okay. All right. So I uh, just wanted to interview you today and just ask you a few questions just so that we can give some people some things to think about, things to pray about uh, as they're moving through this time of isolation, uh, being maybe away from the sacraments, being away from the church. It's probably difficult for lots of us. But I guess the first question I have for you is what has been the best part of maybe all this happening for you personally? I think it's... Uh being reminded that the Lord is always present. Yeah. Uh, we want to pigeonhole him, put him in a box with our neat little plans right. and the constructs we have for our life and uh, to always have the power over figuring everything out in life. And I think this situation over which we're all so very powerless really reminds us that uh, God is sovereign. Christ is still the King of Kings. He's still reigning. He is alive, he's resurrected, he has won the victory over sin and death. So we need to just continue putting all our trust in him and uh, abandon ourselves totally to his divine providence, especially when we feel the weakest and most vulnerable. Right, and I think I think to get back to your point about <laughs> we have all these plans, I think, I think it's cool because our plans a lot of times limit us where God's plan frees us to ultimately be fully who we are where when we put our own activities, our own desires, our own plans in place, it limits us to the time, the constraints, all the different things that the world kind of limits us to, but God's plan ultimately gives us total freedom to follow him, to find fulfillment in ways that we never thought were even possible. So, uh, great, the next question that I have is, what has been uh, what has been the hardest part? Being a deacon, obviously your role at the parish here is to proclaim the word of God uh, to people, and there haven't been a lot of people around except those that are maybe coming for confession, those who are coming for adoration, even at the Mass. So what, what has maybe been the hardest part uh, for you being the deacon here at St. Charles? Uh, I think uh, there's a certain amount of frustration given my medical background, having been in medicine for 30 years, having studied the science of the disease, right. you know, being uh, competent in medicine and knowing disease processes and and uh, having to deal with the irrationality of all the information that's been out there and then the fears that inevitably come when people are basing decisions on or actually lack of good science, lack of medical practices, irrationality. So I think just that frustration of having to, knowing what I know in my background, right. to deal with all that. So I, can you tell me a little bit more? So you were a surgeon, right? And what kind of surgery did you do? Well, I, uh, I trained at the University of Minnesota and then the Mayo Clinic. And then for almost two decades, did uh, general thoracic, which is chest, right. and arterial surgery, vascular surgery. So then the question that has to come to mind is when Hallmark puts all of their hearts on everything, that's not actually what the human heart looks like, right? I've had to, it no, it's, it's not as beautiful and... Doesn't. Filled with love and happiness. Right? It's a thick muscle that pumps blood. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for clearing that up for with me. With no emotion. Yeah, you didn't open someone up and saw <clears throat> a heart that was like from a greeting card. 
a little arrow from Cupid through it. I can't. Number one. So, okay. All right. I just wanted to make sure. Uh, <laughs> so now the other thing that I want to ask you is, what are what are your hopes for people as they're maybe stuck at home? Uh, what are some things that you hope for that, that they should be maybe doing together as a family or uh, thinking about? Uh, just what are some of your desires that people are still trying to grow their faith, still trying to grow in holiness? What would be some things that maybe we can be doing at home? Well, as I mentioned earlier, you know, God is still God. So using really the luxury of time to right. pray more, to read some good books, not just spiritual reading books, which would be great, but reading the scriptures, reading some fun books for leisure, spending time with children, playing games, going out for walks, walking the dog, uh, spending time watching fun, wholesome movies together as a family, just enjoying each other's company. And we're in such a fast-paced society that puts so much emphasis on doing, producing. Right. Now that we can't do as much, now that we can't produce, Sadly, many families are even deprived of income because of this, uh, I think, really unworkable reaction that our culture has taken. So uh, enjoy that time together. Uh, take the time to spend more time uh, thinking about eternal things because we think and put all our stock in this life, these bodies, this world, but in fact, we're made for eternity. So two things that came out of that that I heard is, is you want, <clears throat> focusing on the Lord as the Lord of everything and just giving it to Him. Uh, and then the second thing that really sp spoke to me was that we should play more games. And I'm wondering what game would be your favorite game that if you could play, is it a board game or are you a cards guy? What kind of games do you like to play? Uh, we have a family card game that we've had since we were, we were little. Okay. That came from my in-laws. Uh, it's called Make a Million. Make a Million. Yeah, they have actually their own set of cards oh. for it. And it's just a fun family card game we play a lot. I like to play cribbage. Uh, my favorite board game is probably Monopoly. Well, you have plenty of time now Lots to of finish Monopoly. the whole game. And, uh, and actually just watching some fun things. So I had a little time uh, for leisure last weekend because we're not having all the masses. So. Right. On Saturday, uh, at your suggestion, watch uh, a Christian comedian uh, online and YouTube, Tim Hawkins, yeah. and uh, spent two hours laughing. <laughs> it was good for the soul. Sometimes laughter is the best thing that we can do right now. Yeah. Uh, and then, too, the, one of the other questions that I, that I had for you was just um, with, with you being maybe more susceptible in that age group that's more susceptible, are there certain things that you are more concerned about or are there things that, uh, you know, that, that the population that, that you're part of, that the age demographic that you're part of that, that you would recommend or, or just things that you maybe want to share with that age group? Because a lot of the things we've been doing have been maybe more focused on the youth and young families and people in our school, but is there any word that we could say or something that you could give hope to some of those people maybe that are feeling more, uh, more worried, more... Uh, more sensitive towards it being a greater impact on them? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is just to really have a firm conviction as the beloved disciple John reminds us in his first letter, perfect love casts out fear. Right. So fear, of course, is a, an emotion that we all have over certain things, but, but truly it has to be based on reality, on facts, on the truth. And uh, if we actually examine the facts of this case, which I'll do in a few moments, uh, there really is no justification for the kind of widespread, irrational fear and anxiety that's really gripped our whole society, indeed the whole world. There are, of course, common uh, sense things that, that everyone should be doing, not just the senior population. Uh, washing one's hands frequently with soap and water, using hand sanitizer, uh, when you are touching things, go to the grocery store. Uh, if you are ill, uh, you know, with things that can be spread, even a cough or influenza, you know, staying home so you don't uh, give the disease to anyone else. So that would apply really to, to all our common diseases, not just the COVID uh, virus. But I think really uh, to have the great peace of heart that comes from a lifelong of faithfully following Jesus and worshiping him with a life of prayer. 
And this is a great gift that our senior citizens can give us because they've been so faithful for so long. Uh, many of them are part of the greatest generation. They've gone through depressions and wars and many, many other illnesses and epidemics throughout our, our history in the last 50 years even. So they have a perspective that they can share with us that really we don't need to be afraid of anything. Right. So It was interesting that you say that because on the radio I heard someone say that this is an unprecedented time and we've never seen anything like this in our, our lifetime. And speaking from my own perspective, that's probably true because I'm only 34. But I mean, I was thinking about all the people that were around, you know, even in the, in the aftermath of World War II or the family structures that maybe were starting to break down because of the, the problems with that. And I just think that's kind of a pretty bold statement to say that this is so extreme compared to some of the realities of, of what we've lived through, like you're saying, and what your generation specifically has lived through. In fact, the only thing that's unprecedented is our response. Okay. Not the illness itself. Yeah, so, could you explain that a little bit? Yeah, more? so just I have some data that, that I've, I've published in this sent to a number of my clerical colleagues and to our own staff here. The real risk from this particular illness, known as COVID-19, it's a respiratory virus. It's part of the coronavirus family, which has actually been around a long time. It's responsible for the common cold. Again, it's a respiratory virus, so it tends to get into the respiratory tract, the lungs, breathing, and so it can cause pneumonia, initially viral pneumonia and then bacterial pneumonia. And in people who are older, 65 and older, especially 85 and older, and especially if they have underlying medical disease like diabetes, heart disease, lung disease, or immune disorders, they're particularly susceptible. But having, having said that, just to look and put this all in perspective, uh, and in context, uh, there are only 60,000 cases in the United States so far. 60,000? 60, 60,000, with, okay. with uh, a little more than 800 deaths. So the mortality rate for this, in, on average, uh, in the U.S. is about 1%. Many think that that rate is probably too high and it will come down as we have more experience probably more a rate of about 0.6%, okay. with a high of about 1.3%. Now in the elderly population, however, who are at most risk, that death rate may be as high as 10%, so we don't want to take it lightly. But again, putting it into perspective, the death rate overall in the United States is about three per million persons. Okay. Compare that with influenza. Right. So every year we have influenza outbreak. The death rate in the United States this year from influenza is 70 per million persons. 70-fold increased risk of death from influenza. So instead of it being 3 to a million, it's 70 persons to 70. a million. So the same, the same statistics are based on how many people have had it, how many deaths have happened, uh, and, and the three is the COVID, and the, seven, the 70 is the influenza. And that right. happens, you said, pretty much every year, where we have about that amount? Almost every year. So throughout the world, every year, there are 500,000 cases of influenza. Okay. Correction, 500 million. 500 million. 500 wow. million cases of influenza every year yep. throughout the world. And of those, uh, in... Uh, the United States, I have this data right in front of me. Uh, in the United States, there were almost 28,000 deaths this year from influenza. Okay, 28,000. Currently with COVID, we're looking at about 900 deaths. So putting into perspective, influenza, which is with us every year, right. this is actually one of the lighter seasons. In Minnesota alone this year, uh, there were uh, 100, a little more than 100, 121 deaths in Minnesota from influenza. From influenza. And, and, there's only, and there's only been one death so far from COVID in Minnesota. So 
the point I'm making is that when you put it on scale with many, many other epidemics in our country, in 1952, the polio epidemic, uh, there were 6,000 pediatric deaths from, from polio. Uh, from, the, from the Spanish flu in 1918, 40% of the entire world's population was infected, and there were over 100 million deaths from just Spanish flu. Uh, we've had other flus throughout, throughout this past half century, the Asian flu, the Hong Kong flu, the H1N1 swine flu, uh, the Ebola virus, and all of them had far greater likelihood of death than the current COVID virus. So I'm not saying we shouldn't be alarmed, right. but we have to consider things in perspective and, and relative to these other things. So the risk currently of contracting the disease in the seven county metro area is one in, one in 17,000. So there's one person in every 17,000 people right now that could potentially get, get yes, the virus, yes. statistically speaking. I think it just brings us back to your point about uh, the Lord has conquered the world and, and the trust that we can have in him. And, and we're not called to be afraid of this. We're called to, uh, to stand up and to speak truth, to use our minds, to use our reason, and, and really to allow ourselves to be at peace and then bring that peace to other people. That's kind of what I'm hearing you say because the, the, the data would back up uh, just us being able to trust that the Lord has a plan here and that we shouldn't be maybe so worried or so overwhelmed by the, the reaches of this, this virus. This and I think especially for Father and me as, as clerics of the church, I can tell you that, that I have no fear of this illness and it's not keeping me from doing my work. So in relation to praying and being at the altar every day, Father, and I continue offering Mass every day for the people of God of St. Charles Parish. So you remember it every single day. It's sad that all of us can't be there together, right. but I'm still visiting the sick as I'm able. I'm still bringing communion to those who are severely ill. And if it came to visiting someone who had this illness, I would have absolutely no fear or trepidation of visiting them. I would, of course, take conscious precautions, but I'd have no fear of doing this. The church has to be there at the front lines of ministering to people. We have the great heritage of our saints, St. Charles Borromeo, our patron, who ministered to his own population in the Diocese of Milan, walking the streets of Milan during the plague and famine, visiting and ministering to his people. So we can do no less. Uh, St. Aloysius Gonzaga, the young Jesuit, died of plague as he was ministering to people who were ill. Uh, and there are many other examples, St. Damien of De Booster, the Damien of Molokai, who contracted leprosy, right. ministering to the lepers. So, you know, we have nothing to fear because God is on our side. And it's always important for us to maintain great peace of heart. Right, right. Well, I just thank you so much for your time, for your insights, for your thoughts, for your science. Uh, and two, just, just bringing us this, this good news, this good news that we don't need to be afraid, that we can be bold, that we're still called to great sainthood, we're still called to holiness, uh, and, and in these efforts that you've shared, you know, things at home, spending time as a family, spending time in prayer, uh, hopefully we'll be able to weather this well, no matter what comes our way, and we'll be able to uh, stand before the Lord and say we did what we what were supposed to do, what we should have done. So thank you for your boldness. I just wonder if we can maybe end this video with you giving us your blessing. I'd be happy to. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Father, your son reminded us, thy will be done. We pray this every day, Lord, in the prayer that Jesus taught us. May we abandon ourselves completely to your holy will and seek as the number one priority of our lives eternal union with you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We humbly beseech you, Lord, to give your spirit upon us with wisdom and fortitude. Help us to boldly proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, that perfect love that casts out all fear, and in the words of St. Peter the Apostle, to cast our cares upon you. And now through the intercession of our Blessed Mother, and the holy deacon martyrs, may Almighty God bless us, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Deacon. Hope you have a great rest of the day.
if anybody needs uh, anything or prayers, they can just reach you by email, phone call. Phone we're call. Still able we're to still do. here. We're still working. Awesome. Your office is open. Great. Jesus is still here. He is indeed. Awesome. Thank you so much, Deacon.